Now, this also got me thinking. <laughs> um, a lot of Ehlers Danlos patients exhibit symptoms basically from birth. Now, these are not uh, symptoms that necessarily alarmed doctors, but as time went by and we developed disabling dysautonomia or POTS, uh, I realized that no one had looked back to see when we were babies what was happening or what could have been happening to cause these symptoms. I went on to develop, um, very obvious to myself, um, high intracranial pressure, as did my children. And then talking to hundreds of patients, which, thank you so much, who doesn't love social media, my goodness, I was realizing that this was very likely a, a slight level of too much pressure on our brains, intracranial hypertension, perhaps from birth. And if so, this should uh, show itself by looking at the head circumference growth in the first 15, 16 months of life before the, the closure of the sutures of the skull and started this study. Um, and again, it's at clinicaltrials.gov, just wrapping it up now and pretty exciting results, I've got to tell you. Uh, at this, this stage, you can see in blue, our head circumferences on average went from about 40% to close to 100% of normal um, using CDC's 2008 data of normalcy, if you will. That is not uh, normal, my friends. It, it shouldn't change like that. So that's leading us down some exciting roads. Very quick review of CSF dynamics. I know you understand this, but I myself had to review it too. The CSF is produced there in the choroid plexus. It drains through the third, fourth ventricle down, down the spinal canal and back up and around into the subarachnoid space up above the brain and out, hopefully, to the arachnoid villi. Um, into the superior sagittal sinus, basically. Some goes out through the lymphatic outflow, etc. But basically through the arachnoid villi and then to the sinus, out the transverse sinus, and away you go, and through the internal jugular vein. So uh, as my pressure became more and more obvious to me, and it was just purely symptoms of pressure, I could tell. And I took also uh, a medication that increase, increases blood volume, which is often used for POTS, and made that headache a gazillion times worse. I grabbed an expired bottle of Diamox, which every good eye doctor has in the back of their cabinet somewhere, because we need it for emergency closed-angle glaucoma patients, um, among other things. We hardly ever see these patients, but we have to have the Diamox available to, to quickly or as quickly as we can decrease some of the pressure in the eye, and it, it also decreases the intracranial pressure. It also is a mild diuretic. Um, I popped a couple of those uh, out of absolute desperation because the pressure was just killing me. And lo and behold, my symptoms were gone the next morning. So continued to use acetazolamide and continued to improve, but still had symptoms. And I thought, something is still missing. And the missing piece from my research, I truly believe, is mast cell disease. Mast cells can cause leaky and weak varicose vessels. They release over 60 very strong chemicals, including histamine, which is a big one, tryptase, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and cytokines. Now, we already know that mast cells are related to MS. Research is already out. And I realize also that many of us don't have normal mast cells. Uh, abnormal mast cells look kind of funky. They, they grow too fast. They don't die as early. They tend to accumulate. Um, it can even extend to something similar to a cancer, if you will, and can actually be deadly within a year or two, which is really scary. But fortunately, that, that's kind of rare. Mast cells love to hide out in our organs, our lungs, livers, GI tract. Oh, yes. Gluten intolerance, IBS symptoms. Absolutely. They go to the lymph nodes, the skin, kidneys, eyes, where we would see granulomatous uveitis, pars planitis, um, which is very common in multiple sclerosis, incredible dryness and itching. Um, and they go into the brain. Now, triggers for mast cell degranulation, I can't help but notice this overlaps with quite a few triggers of multiple sclerosis. Heat, 
exercise, hormones, positive or negative emotions or stress, certain foods or coloring flavors, alcohol, caffeine, certain smells, etc. So here we go. We can tie it all together. Now, in the brain, um, mast cells can cause brain fog, dementia. I mean, uh, some people say it's brain fog, but I am here to tell you I have been there, and whoever calls it brain fog has not had this condition. It is dementia, my friends. Changes in personality, many of us describe it as a bipolar presentation, and I would also. I had that for two weeks where it was extreme, and I could identify that my responses to stimulus, be it good or bad, was um, not in relation to the stimulus itself. It was over-response, but I still couldn't control it. Um, we call it organic brain disease. Extreme fatigue. This is a great picture. Thank you, Dr. Sclafani and Dr. Uh, Gabbiani, for, for these beautiful views of collagen 1 and collagen 3. Mast cells are um, changing the collagen in our vessels to this looser, weaker type, if you will, in varicose veins. Mast cells love to hide out in the choroid plexus. My friends, this is where we produce cerebral spinal fluid. So if the mast cells there are stimulated to degranulate in the choroid plexus, they could absolutely stimulate a sudden surge in uh, cerebral spinal fluid production, which I have also <laughs> experienced. And then that leads to a domino effect, which I can go into. Certainly we see that in hyperadrenergic postural orthostatic tachycardia tachycardia, which is one of the syndromes I have. Um, waste products can accumulate around the brain because we're not draining things. Um, as you know, uh, the, we have to get the bad stuff out to get the good stuff in. Okay. We are at, I believe, this tipping point where we can accept a certain level of increase in, of intracranial pressure and still be okay. But you get to this point, shown by this little arrow, where any increase in intracranial pressure displaces a great volume of, of, of brain tissue. And this is bad, bad, bad. Um, so this ties together mast cell disease, the reasons for CCSVI to occur and involve the conversion of collagen 1 to collagen 3, why our blood-brain barriers are leaky, what is happening to the arachnoid villi. We didn't go, in, go into that very in very good detail. I need to get back to that. Um, the cause of granulomatous uveitis and pars planitis in MS patients, why MS symptoms can wax and wane, the cause of extreme fatigue, brain fog, dementia, GI symptoms, n and numerous other ocular symptoms, and the cause of optic neuritis. Again, I didn't get to touch on that, but that's all tied in. wanted to just breeze through really quick astrocytes. One, because they're so pretty, aren't they? <laughs> they are intertwined with the neurons, axons, and myelin, and brain capillaries, of course. Uh, they help uh, make our blood-brain barrier tight and non-leaky. Interestingly, they can produce pro-inflammatory cytokines and stimulate it. They also can respond to cytokines, which is not a real good cycle to get into because after cytokine release, the immune cells can actually invade the brain and activate, activate these astrocytes, which res results in apto uh, apoptosis and gliosis, as we know, is not good. So you get this compromise of the blood-brain barrier, which causes fluid in the interstitial space, which leads to vasogenic cerebral edema, which leads to an increase in intracranial pressure, which then can cause the collapse in brain capillaries, an arrest of cerebral perfusion, and then, ironically, it, which damages the astrocytes, which can cause, again, back to the circle, compromising further the blood-brain barrier. The damage to the astrocytes also will occur with damage to neurons and myelins. Uh, myelin, excuse me. This is a very vicious circle. You can see how the use of a carbonic and hydrase inhibitor, such as acetazolamide, can break certain parts of this cycle. It can remove some of the fluid in the interstitial space. It can take out some basogenic cerebral edema, lower some of the intracranial pressure, hopefully allow the brain capillaries to, to be restored, and can arrest uh, this vicious cycle with um, a lack of cerebral perfusion. Final considerations, and um, these are things to think about. Should we screen MS patients for Ehlers-Danlos? 90% of Ehlers-Danlos patients are never diagnosed. I think yes. It is an 
uh, a fairly easy screening tool, the Biden scale, to run people through, and it's amazing what you'll find. You certainly do not want to do angioplasty on a vascular Ehlers-Danlos patient. The first person to find one of those and miss it and perform angioplasty, they are going to wish they had ran a, ran a Biden scale. Um, should we consider a trial of acetazolamide to reduce intracranial pressure for symptom re reduction? Yes, especially in patients who either can't have angioplasty, um, had a partial response to angioplasty, um, can't afford it, what have you. I, I absolutely think that could be a, a good Band-Aid. Should we consider acetazolamide prior to uh, CCSVI angioplasty to allow more influx of oxygenated blood into the brain, potentiating the effects of angioplasty? Of course, I think yes. Yes, we should. We should certainly consider mast cell disorders in multiple sclerosis patients. I've just had too much success um, not to consider that. And also, mast cell mediators could be some of that ca the cause of restenosis. I think we can cut down on the numbers of, of restenosis that we have by addressing mast cell mediators. Um, mast cell patients are not easily uh, diagnosed if they don't have cutaneous signs. You may not know it, but uh, it can certainly be figured out. And even the trial with an H1 and H2 inhibitor is easy, easy sneezy to see if that just helps them feel better. And the protocol for um, mast cell activation syndrome has changed, and yeah, as you'll find out, I'll discuss that in another presentation, I guess. But anyone who may have mast cell disorders, I would recommend pretreatment. And especially, I, I do think we need to address the post-angioplasty protocol on trigger avoidance to prevent restenosis. Um, I think that protocol after the procedure needs to be very rigorous. Uh, rigorous. Um, uh, the patient needs to be very uh, um, rigorous in following it, let me put it that way, because rest is extremely important, one of the... the strongest triggers for uh, degranulation of mast cells is stress, be it good stress or bad stress. But then the other trigger avoidance, I think, is critical. Even the procedure itself could cause mast cell degranulation. It needs to be addressed. Of course, we have to understand that people with mast cell conditions do risk, run a risk of anaphylaxis, um, and we need to be ready for that, if, should that occur. And remember, if all else fails, reach for what you know, and that is duct tape. Uh, all this can be found with much more information, my clinical trials, handouts, videos, etc., on prettyill.com. I want to thank you for your time and attention. I, I appreciate every one of you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.